name's Christopher Busby, and I'm talking to you from the Latvian Academy of Sciences in Riga. And uh, this is um, communication uh, in the series of communications relating to criminalized nuclear war systems, the last of which was uh, um, uh, produced here from the Science Academy in March of last year. And I'm here to, to update you on what's happened since then um, in the area in which I'm active, which is the area of the health effects of low doses of ionizing radiation and the fallout from nuclear weapons. An enormous amount of um, development has occurred in this area since March of last year. And one of the most important pieces of, um, of, of evidence, one of the most important developments has come about as a result of a study that I uh, carried out with um, Professor Inge Schmitzfeuerhacker of Germany um, and Professor Sebastian Frugbach, um, both members of the European Committee on Radiation Risk. And you can see that I'm a corresponding member of the Latvian Academy of Science in Riga. And this, this paper was published in a very prestigious journal called Environmental Health and Toxicology, which is a journal of the Korean Society for Environmental Health. Um, I got to know these people when I went to Korea to do a court case there, where there were some people um, taking on the local nuclear industry um, over increases in cancer, thyroid cancer, close to their nuclear plants. Um, the, the Korea is quite a, a nuclearized, South Korea this is quite a nuclearized nation. And in fact, they were so, they were so happy to have me there that, that they elected me to the editorial board of this outfit and bought me a special bow tie, which you can see here. This is a Korean bow tie, which I'm wearing in honor of the Korean Society for Environmental Toxicology. So this paper, what it did is, for the first time, is it estimated correctly or accurately the genetic effects of, of, the, of the exposure to, if you like, fallout. This is the material that comes from nuclear weapons, from the fissioning of uranium. Um, it's the stuff that fell out in the 1960s all over the world, global fallout. And it's the stuff that comes out of nuclear accidents like Chernobyl and Fukushima. Now, the, the, the thing is that the current radiation risk model up until today, which is the model of the International Commission on Radiological Protection, this is the standard model which all countries now employ, certainly in the West, it says that there are no heritable effects, there are no genetic effects uh, from the exposure to ionizing radiation. And that was because they never found any when they looked at the Hiroshima survivors, which is the, the golden yardstick of um, measurement for the health effects of radiation. Now mostly what they do is they use the uh, lifespan study of the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki to see how many cancers you get at the various doses that these people were exposed to. Of course they don't know the doses that they were exposed to, they just collect them together in groups of very close to the bomb, not so far from the bomb and jolly far away from the bomb. Uh, and on the basis of those three groups, when they looked to see the congenital malformation rates in the children of the survivors, they found there was no difference. So what they say is that there's no heritable, heritable effects from ionizing radiation, uh, and they, they base their doubling dose, this is the dose required to double the risk of getting children with congenital malformations, they, they base it on mice, experiments with mice. And, and, the, and the doubling dose that's been, include, been decided on is approximately 1,000 millisieverts to double the, the, the risk of congenital malformations. But what we did, and mainly what my colleagues uh, Inga Schmitz, Farhag and Sebastian Fugbar did, uh, is they came along and they looked at all of the studies that had been carried out after Chernobyl. Um, and uh, I'll show you what the conclusions were in the in the abstract here, this has been only published recently. This was published in this present form in May of this year. And you can see the conclusions. We conclude that the current risk model for heritable effects of radiation is unsafe. The dose response relationship is non-linear with the greatest effects at the lowest doses. 
using Chernobyl data, we derive an excess relative risk for all malformations of 1.0 per 10 millisieverts cumulative dose. The safety of the Japanese A bomb epidemiology is argued to be both scientifically and philosophically questionable, owing to errors in the choice of control groups, the omission of internal exposure effects, and assumptions about linear dose response. Now, this might sound a bit, a bit technical to you, but to translate it into reality, what it says is that the doubling dose is 10 millisieverts. Whereas the doubling dose that's given by the ICRP is 1,000 millisieverts. So that it means that for this increase in genetic damage to children following exposure of their parents, the ICRP is out by at least 100 times. Now this is an absolute bombshell. This is an enormous study, to, to an, an enormous finding. And it's based on real data, so it's not based on the on the on the um, Japanese A bomb survivors. It's based on people in lots of different countries of Europe who were exposed to the, the radiation from Chernobyl. And I can show you the list now in the table one here, where all this data is. And I'll just briefly show you the amount of information that is here that shows all this. Now this this table is sideways on. But I'm not going to bother to turn it round. I meant to just show it sideways on and just give you an idea. I'll just talk you through one, some of these. There we are. So we have studies that were carried out in Belarus, here in the Belarus National Genetic Monitoring Register. And they know what the dose is, and they found increase, increases. They're comparing before Chernobyl with after Chernobyl. And this is a, this is a register of projected malformations, and they found a significant increase, which which, which was uh, related to the amount of contamination. And if we go through this list, which I won't do, we found that the similar effects were found in nearly all the countries in Europe. Certainly, all the countries in Europe where anybody bothered to look. They found that there was an, a, a sudden increase. If you looked at the number of children with spina bifida, with, with neurological defects, with heart, congenital heart defects, with Down syndrome, with, with uh, polydactyly too many fingers, with, with limb reduction defects, so like those children, the thalidomide children who had very short arms, a whole range of congenital anomalies. There was a doubling in rate after or more sometimes, depending upon the dose, in countries from Turkey to Croatia to Italy to Greece to Egypt um, to, to Finland to um, anywhere that, that anybody looked, they found these increases in the genital malformation. And the doses that were involved in terms of the United Nations definitions of doses were all very, very small, all below one millisiever or two millisieverts in the highest doses in Belarus. So what we were able to show, and this is now published in a, in a prestigious peer review paper, is that the ICRP model is completely wrong by a very, very large amount for congenital malformations. Now, we have always argued, this is the European Committee on Radiation Risk, who I represent, and here's, here's the report that you will have seen before if you listen, if you listen to me. Um, this, this report is the, is the report of the European Committee on Radiation Risk, on, and it talks about cancer, and it does talk about genetic effects too. But mainly it talks about how the ICRP has got, has, got, has got it wrong for internal radionuclides by factors of between 400 and 1,000 times. And the reason for that is that the ICRP model doesn't really consider the ways in which these radionuclides operate inside the body as chemicals. So for instance, very many of them actually bind, they have high chemical affinity for the DNA, and the DNA is known to be the target for genetic effects. And so we've argued this for cancer, but now we see that it's also true for genetic damage. Now what does this mean? What this means is that the nuclear releases to the, env <coughs> to the environment since 1950, when the, when the planet has been filling up with strontium-90 and cesium-137 and plutonium and uranium-234 and all these things, has caused a massive impact to the genome of all living systems, not just human beings, all living systems. 
it's, it's, as I, as I, and I'm going to talk about, about, about long sickness and sudden death. Well, this is, this is the long sickness part of what I'm going to talk about, the effects of radioactive pollution. But the big breakthrough, the big leap forward in this area, and one that, that it's going to be very difficult for the governments of the world and the ICRP and the modelers and the risk agencies and all these people in this country, in every country in Europe, in those who are administering the European Basic Safety Standards regulations, which cover the whole of Europe, those people are not going to be able to, to, to um, ignore this evidence. Because this is not just evidence where Chris Busby and a few of his uh, colleagues say, look, you know, there are problems here. It's, it's evidence that comes from lots and lots of different countries. And, and uh, th th this paper is available on the internet. Anybody can download it. You can see that there's a graph here that we can, I can show you here of something that happened in Berlin. So this is a, this is a you look here, you can, this is Down syndrome, which is a chromosome and abnormality. It's a chromosome damage abnormality. And you can see just in January 1987 in West Berlin and in Belarus, you have this sharp increase in, um, in Down syndrome. And now the doses they were really very small, and that shouldn't have happened. And what the United Nations said is they said that these blips that they saw, because they accepted that there were these apparent increases, they said they couldn't be due to Chernobyl because the doses were too small. Now this is not science. Science says that if you see something, you have to look for the cause. You can't say that it can't be the cause because you have some theory that shows that it can't be the cause. So if we go down this now, and see what, at the end of this paper, you can see all of the studies that have been done that show these effects. You can look at these references now. There are lots and lots and lots of references. Sarchenko, Kulakov, female reproductive function in areas affected by radiation on which an old fire station act accident. Petrova, Morbidity in a large cohort study of children brought to mothers exposed to radiation from Chernobyl. Shidlovsky, general morbidity of the population in districts of the breast region. Wetlecki, malformations in the Chernobyl impacted region. There are almost a hundred references here. We had to have, we had a lot of difficulty in getting the, the, the journal to accept so many references. It, it, it was, it was, it was extraordinary the amount of stuff that there is. Look at this, it goes on. Changes in fetal childhood. This is massive data, it's real data. Abnormalities in the barrier. Changes in fetal and childhood autopsies in the region of Jena, this is Germany. Eckerman, now this is, a, this, is a, this is one that I did, this Yabrikov wrote a book about this. Incidents of childhood disease in Belarus associated with the Chernobyl accident. It goes on and on and on. So there is no doubt at all that we have dropped a very large bomb into the pond of the current assessment of risk from ionizing radiation for childhood anomalies, for congenital malformations. Now when it comes to cancer, what, what can be done is they can say, well, you know, you get the exposure like 20 years ago and then you get the cancer. You can't prove that that exposure caused the cancer. You can't prove it because it's a long period of time that, that's taken place. And there are lots of other things that can cause cancer. But when you're talking about congenital malformations, you're talking about an exposure to the mother or the father, and then the child comes out with two heads or with, with, with a heart defect or whatever it is, all of those horrible things that everybody's seen in the pictures of the children in Fallujah who are exposed to depleted uranium. All of those things. So this is a major impact on the health risk paradigm, and it will make changes. Now, after we published this, and whilst we were publishing this, I was also engaged at the same time in, a, in probably the biggest court case that has ever existed uh, discussing this issue of the health effects of radiation. For about, since about 2009, I have been engaged in 
working for no money, incidentally. There's no money in this. It's all because I'm a good guy. You can tell by my bow tie. Um, working for the nuclear test veterans. These, these were English people who were young men in the 1950s and who were conscripted. And they were sent out to the Pacific and to Australia to help create the British bomb. Uh, the British in those days were, an, an the Americans and of course and the Russians were creating larger and larger what they call hydrogen bombs or thermonuclear bombs. And these bombs were exploded in the case of the British uh, tests. They were exploded in the atmosphere at Christmas Island, which is a small coral atoll in the, in the Pacific. Um, and they were also, t uh, before that, they were tested in, in Australia, in the western desert of Australia. And, but then the Australians got fed up with the radiation that was coming off the bombs, so they threw them out. So the, the big bombs were, were exploded uh, in the Pacific at Christmas Island. So what happens is that, that these veterans, as they get older, suffer from cancer. And then they apply for a, what's called a war pension, because they say that as a result of their work in the army, that's why they got the cancer, because they were exposed to radiation. And traditionally what's happened is that the, the military, the Ministry of Defence in Britain says, no, you can't have a pension because the doses are too low. But we've just seen here that the doses of one millisievert can cause these, these enormous increases in congenital malformation. And, so there, and also we've seen um, from the studies that have been done elsewhere that there is an association of low-dose radiation and cancer. But, but the Ministry of Defence say the ICRD model, which is the current model, doesn't permit us to agree that, that your cancer can be caused by the amount, small amount of radiation that you're exposed to. Of course, we're not concerned about small amounts of radiation, we're concerned about internal radiation, which is quite a different matter. So the, the concept of dose, we say, doesn't apply for internal radiation. It's, a, it's because dose, dose is energy per unit mass. So you can stand in front of a fire and warm yourself and get a certain amount of energy and divide by your mass and get a dose, but you can reach into the fire, you can take out a hot coal and you can eat it, and that actually is the same amount of energy per unit mass. And this, this uh, analogy is actually quite accurate when it comes to internal radiation. So this court case, uh, these court cases, I, I, well, I say one, but I was successful in about five or six of them. And then the Ministry of Defence took them all into one bag and said we're going to hear 16 cases all in one, in one courtroom. And I was then uh, enrolled, um, commissioned by the solicitors, by the lawyers, to act as the expert witness. But at the last minute the, the, the lawyers that were dealing with the case pulled out. Another lot of lawyers came in, they threw me out as an expert witness and all the cases were lost. But then, the, then, then those people appealed to the upper court, and then it was, and the, the appeal was allowed. It went to the upper court. The upper court allowed the appeal, uh, and at the same time, they remitted the hearing to a new lower tier. So in other words, it's, 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 they lost the case. It went to appeal. It came down to a new case, and that's the case I'm talking about now, because that's the case where this case went in as evidence. Now. At the same time, um, and for whatever reason, there are various people who have got theories about this, but what happened was that I was kicked out as an expert witness. The, 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 high, the, the, the appeal court was approached by the Ministry of Defence. They said, Chris Busby is not a proper expert. Uh, and then when it was decided I was a proper expert, they said, well, he's biased because he's an activist. He's somebody who does what I'm doing now, talking to the camera and, and, and spreading the message to people, because real scientists don't do that. You know, real experts, independent experts who are unbiased, they don't talk to the press, they don't go out on YouTube, they don't write articles in The Ecologist, they generally sort of sit in the universities and they, and they ask, purer than driven snow, um, whiter than white. But I'm not like that, I've never been that sort of scientist. Can, so, I, can I come in and help you out here? Yeah. I mean, um, maybe scientists are heartless, uh, consciousness people. No, they frighten people. That's what they are. They lose their jobs. Exactly. Yeah. So they are a sort of kind of slaves then, and they are not free minds, and then they are not experts. Then, I, then they are biased by their of job. Of course, of course, of course. Absolutely. So this is totally vice versa. You are the expert, and 
they are not. Well, this is what I argued in the High Court, but the judge said no. He said under English law, I was biased and that was that. And of course, you know, the argument is we could then, when they bring in their experts, we could, if we had the money, we could then put them in court and say that they're all the things that you say, you know, that they're biased and all the rest of it. Anyway, we don't have the money. So, but what the judge did when he said that I couldn't be an act as an expert, he said, but there's no reason why you can't act as the lawyer. Uh, and so at that point, I, I, I took on the role of the lawyer. So now we have a completely new case, and they wish they'd never done this, I can tell you. We have a completely new case in which I am now not the expert, where I stand in the witness box and somebody cross-examines me. I am the lawyer, so I, they stand in the witness box and I cross-examine them. And I did that with, with, with quite, quite singular effect on them, I can tell you. Because, I mean, I am not only able to act as a, as a, as a lawyer, because I've been in enough court cases to, to know how lawyers act, so I can just, I can just you know, be a lawyer like, like those, I can just act like a lawyer, and I'm quite good at it. Well, my lord, that may well be the case, but on the other hand, you may have to consider the fact that it's possible that you're wrong, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, and so I did an awful lot of that, and I can tell you it was jolly stressful. It was a very long time too. It was three weeks trial. Yeah, it was a three week, three. I was on my feet like this, saying, uh, "Objection! Well, my lord, if you allow these people to bring in the paper that you've already excluded on the basis that you say that I'm on the paper, it doesn't seem very fair." Sit down, Dr. Busby. <laughs> yeah. So it was all a bit like that. But anyway, I got my four witnesses in, and and uh, one of them was Professor Schmidt's file on this paper here. German lady, she's 80. We were all old. We're all old people, you know. I mean, I'm 70, she was 80. Uh, Shoji Sawada, who came all the way from Japan, we flew him over from Japan, he's 86. He was blown up at Hiroshima. He was actually blown up at Hiroshima. And he was uh, he lay under a big girder, and his mother was trapped, and she said, you must run, Shoji. And he said, I cannot leave you, mother. And she said, you must run. Anyway, so he tells the story. So he gets in the witness box, and the first thing the judge says is, we don't want to hear anything about your experiences in Hiroshima. Anyway. Uh, now, I'm a little bit constrained about what I say about this court case, because my colleagues have told me that if I say too much about this case, it will upset the judge, and the judge will then find against us. But my own feeling is that's nonsense. And also, I also think that if he does, he will anyway. And if he doesn't, it doesn't matter. So I'm going to say a little bit about the court case particularly by the evidence that went in. Now, of course, our major, our major piece of evidence was this, but the first thing that the, that the judge said is that you can't use this as evidence because your name is on it. <laughs> uh, so he said, you know, because, because the upper tier, because the appeal court has ruled out that Dr. Busby uh, is an expert, it therefore follows that anything he writes in the peer-reviewed literature must also be thrown out. But luckily, what happened is that, um, that the Ministry of Defence, who were so surprised by this, forgot about it. And what they did is that they brought in this paper in order to attack it, you see. So, so, so that, that's what Stuart Smith calls, they opened the door. Because, of course, once it's in the proceedings, then you can refer to it, you see. Uh, and at the same time, what I did, which I thought was rather nifty, was that I thought, well, if they can't refer to the paper, what they have to do then is refer to the papers that the paper refers to. So I, I, I then took off the, about eight of the most important papers that we relied upon in this paper, and I rushed out to a photocopying shop and made eight copies of them and, 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 and submitted them formally into the court proceedings. So they went in. Anyway, it was, it was horrifyingly stressful. Uh, that was one piece of evidence that we had here was about these congenital malformations. And the important thing about that is actually we have already studied congenital malformations in the test veterans, so let me show you this. Um, so this is another paper. Yeah. So you will see this one. It's called, it's, it's from a, another journal called Epidemiology of Access. Um, and it was published by myself and the Countess, Mireille um, de messier And again, you see Environmental Research, SIA, Green Audit. And uh, this was a study that we did in 2000, and, although it was published in 2014, 
we did the study in 2007, uh, and we looked at the members of the British Nuclear Test Veterans Association, and we asked them, we sent a questionnaire around, and we asked them lots of questions about how many children they had and how many of these children had got congenital malformations. And what we found was quite extraordinary. There were, based on 600 veteran children and 749 grandchildren, uh, and we compared this with controls, but we also compared it with the national population, and we got roughly the same answer. We found that there was uh, almost three times the number of miscarriages in the veterans' wives. Um, there was four times perinatal mortality, that's stillbirths and, and um, infant mortality in the first month. Uh, and, we found, and for congenital malformations, we found that the odds ratio, that's the, the increased amount of congenital malformations in the veterans relative to the controls or relative to the national population, was about 10. Now, uh, that, that means that these veterans had 10 times the congenital malformations in their children than the national population. But as well as that, and the most interesting thing was that the grandchildren also had eight times. So now this, is, this, this means it's not genetic, because if it was genetic it would fall down quite, because what happens of course is that the children then marry out, so they marry somebody who's not been affected, and then it dilutes down in the same way as the Mendelian genetic loss of, of, of genetic damage should occur. But that isn't occurring. What we've got here is what we're seeing is almost the same level of genetic damage in the children and in the grandchildren. So it's increasing then, by well, the way. Well, it's not increasing, but it's remaining the same. And that shouldn't happen. That shouldn't happen. That shouldn't happen. That means that it is increasing. Well, all right. But what, yes, if you want to put it like that. And we know how that works now. As a result of studies of Chernobyl and studies that have recently been published by my colleague Alexander Fushik um, from Croatia, we know that what happens with radiation is it causes what's called genomic uh, genomic damage, uh, and the, the, the genomic instability is the word. And what that means is that any population which is exposed to small amounts of radiation just suddenly starts to cause its genes to scramble. And the idea is to scramble around the, the threat. So you just get general genetic damage after a single, and it goes right down through generations. So in, in some of the nice studies that have been done after Chernobyl, it's gone through 22 generations and they're still showing the same effects. Gosh. So it's a sort of like a genetic play. Anyway, so this went in as evidence. It was, it was tremendously attacked, of course, by the Ministry of Defense. The, the Ministry of Defense said it was a useless study and it had all sorts of things wrong with it. And, you know, that, that they just called it lots of names and so forth. But anyway, nevertheless, this is not the only study that shows this. There was another study by a woman called Rabbit Roth in 2000 and, you know, 1999, which was a larger sample of the same people, the British nuclear test veterans. And what that also showed is that there was about a tenfold increase in genetic damage. But in, that, in her study, which was an earlier study, it was fivefold, five times increase in the grandchildren. So what we know is that the, the nuclear test veterans themselves, whether they've got cancer or not, suffered an enormous excess risk of congenital malformation in their children. We also know that in Chernobyl, the same thing happened because we have the schmitz Hart paper that I just talked to you about. So we've now connected the Chernobyl radiation with the material that, with the, 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 the um, test veterans were exposed to Christmas Island. Now, were they exposed? Now, this is something that came out also in the, in the discussions and in the various papers that were submitted or obtained under um, freedom of information requests and disclosure requests. Uh, throughout, this whole, throughout this whole period, like the, maybe five years involved, that I've been involved in, in fighting the Ministry of Defence, we find it extremely difficult to get any actual contemporary data. So, in other words, they won't tell us how much uranium was there, they won't tell us how much cesium-137, they say they've lost all the papers that, that they had that shows this, and there are no papers available that show that. They're just keeping a lid on everything. They, 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 they won't let us have any information. But the small amount of information that has come out has enabled us to find a number of really interesting things. Now, their argument has always been that these people were never exposed to uh, any fallout because the bombs were exploded high up in the air and the 
fallout drifted out to sea because they only exploded the bombs when the winds were blowing offshore. This is very important. So, that, so this is why they, they, they don't give uh, pensions, because they said there was no explosion, because the bombs always uh, blew the radioactivity offshore. But what we found when we looked at the data is that the wind direction changes at altitude. So although the wind was blowing offshore in the lower level winds, the, for the upper level winds it was blowing in the opposite direction. So although the lower part of the mushroom cloud blew offshore, as it went up in the air, the upper part of the mushroom cloud blew back over Christmas Island, and then, and then it, it got larger and larger. And, and these mushroom clouds, the mushroom cloud from, from the big three megaton test, the upper wide test, was enormously big. It almost covered the entire land mass of Christmas Island. And so then it blew in the opposite direction over the island, and then it fell in the sea, and the, the, and the current in that direction is in the direction of the island. So all of that stuff came back ashore onto the island. And the wind that was, of course, the lower wind is blowing in the opposite direction too, so that blew it all back over the island as well. So there's lots of evidence about how they could have been contaminated. And the contamination was from particles, we say, of uranium. So we introduced an enormous amount of evidence that uranium particles are extremely genotoxic. And we, pre we brought in evidence from the United States where they looked at congenital malformations in the veterans of the Gulf Wars that did, who were exposed to depleted uranium. Lots of papers in America on that, also cited here. Um, and uh, what else? Yes, uh, Namib in Namibian miners, they have genetic damage shown by chromosome defects. Uh, chromosome defects are also found in the Gulf War veterans. That were studies that were done by Heike Schroeder in the University of Bremen, also with English Minister of um, And we see chromosome damage also in, in, in people exposed to uranium who work for the nuclear industry. Now, the importance of that is that some years ago, some New Zealand veterans, 15 New Zealand veterans, were tested for chromosome damage using a, um, using a technique called FISH, fluorescence immuno, immunoassay hybridization, no, well, I can't remember exactly what it's called, FISH. Yeah, and they found that these, these um, New Zealand test veterans had a threefold excess of, of chromosome damage. So this, this ties in with the exposure to the fallout. Um, so basically the case was enormously powerful one. Uh, from, from every direction that you looked, you could show not only that these people were exposed to radiation, to the fallout, to the uranium particles and so on, you could show that the uranium particles were very much more dangerous than everybody had thought, that uranium binds to DNA, you, you could show that it causes congenital malformations, and then you found congenital malformations in the veterans, which meant that they had been exposed. So it's a watertight case. However, and also not only that, but the, but the law in, in, this, in this particular type of, of uh, case has to do with whether they get a pension or not, and that's based on reasonable doubt. So you don't have to prove that they were exposed, you just have to raise the issue of reasonable doubt. So if there's reasonable doubt over which, whether, they, whether their cancers were caused by a previous exposure, they get the pensions and we win. So you must ask yourself, how is it that the MOD could deal with all of this? I mean, what, to, what position did they have to, 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 to take that would, that would cause them to win the case? And what they did was really quite clever. So first of all, what they did was they didn't address one single aspect of anything that we said throughout the whole case. Although the judge made an order to them to respond to every single argument that we made in our statement of case, they did not. And so right at the end of it all, what they said was they said that our witnesses, because they were like friends of Chris Busby, or because they were part of some organization called the ECRR, were part of a, uh, an activist system. They, were, they tried to tar them with the same brush that they'd already taken me out with in the, in the, Supreme, in the, upper, in the appeal court. So that their methodology is to say, well, Chris Busby, you know, he can't be an expert. So therefore, anybody who's like a friend of his can't be an expert. And so they, they asked the judge to throw all of that stuff out. Yeah, but that is what we should do. Because, because look at this situation. These courts and these ex corporate experts, they are also, they should be ruled 
don't. Because they are working for the industrial establishment. Well, of course. Who are waging war, I think. Well, I know. I know. Humanity. Yeah, but the, but, the, but the problem is they've got the big fists. You know, it's like Shannon Massa's political power comes out of the mouth of a cannon. I mean, you can say all these things, you can set up your own courts. I mean, we, we set up a permanent people's tribunal after Chernobyl with Rosalie Bertel and various people. We've set up our own systems, and you can find people guilty. I mean, look at, the, look at what we're talking about. This is the criminalized war system, of the Padana Peace Foundation. I mean, I was there giving evidence on depleted uranium for Padana. Uh, they, they, they criminalized Tony Blair. They found, they found the Western courts uh, were wrong in, in, in not saying that it was a, um, an illegal act to go to war in Iraq and so forth. Um, but look, nobody listens to them. They just they can just put it on the internet and they can say and as I I talked to Tim Nahate who ran, ran it and, and, and he said what do you do and he said well we say we're going to we're going to say that if we find it is the case we will then append the word war criminal behind Tony Blair's name so for whatever anybody writes about him they say Tony Blair practiced war criminal said in the communique yesterday blah 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 well you can do all that. But, but meanwhile, the world goes on without us. And, and if we don't win this case, because they win this, this argument about all of my experts being activists, which is absurd, because we're talking about you know, papers that have been peer-reviewed. So effectively, they say the peer-review system, it, they can ignore. They can say that independent scientists have come along and look at work that has been done and publish it in a reputable journal. Those people are, are above the law. You can say, well, we don't care what they say because this is obviously wrong. Because Chris Busby or Englishman Swayarka or whoever it happens to be is, um, is an activist. So we can ignore the science. They can do that. They can do anything they like because they have the power. That's the problem. That's the problem. And all we can do is squeak into the microphone and put out videos like this and say that they're, like you say, saying that they're the criminals. And of course they are. The number of people that have died Most importantly, of the corporations that they represent are the criminals. And they have no right to exist. There is this fabulous uh, documentary on, uh, that is called Corporation. They are immortal. So, uh, I'll just say Monsters, one. these corporations. They, they have no right to exist. Well... This is a historical development of a, of a monstrous machine, in my opinion. Exactly. Uh, and the monstrous machine is sort of self-perpetuating in some way. And right now it's automated. <laughs> yes, that's right. It's, it's, it's sort of, you're, you call to the corporation and they say, we can't do anything, no, it's automated, yeah, it's, it's, we cannot impact it's it. It's a sort of subtle way, a subtle way in which computers are taking, away, taking over the world, it's true. But I'll just show you one thing that happened here, and one very, very important thing here is that and this is, a, this is a presentation by Professor Sowerder, and it's, it's another way in which we can show that even the current risk model for external radiation is ridiculously wrong. So, what, you, what you've got is a picture here of... Yeah, okay. This is in Japanese. So, what happens when this nuclear bomb takes place? This is, a, this is Nagasaki. Is that it sucks in, there's a huge explosion here, and the pressure wave comes down, and it causes, uh, and then as the heat causes it to rise up into the mushroom cloud, what happens is that it sucks in moist air from the sea, because both of these, both of these cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, are on the sea. So this moist air from the sea comes up into the cloud, and then it causes rain, it causes, uh, and, and that it was called, caused black rain. Now what Sawada did was extremely clever. He, in, in, in the late 90s, the, the foundation, the Radiation Effects Research Foundation, uh, published data on, on immediate non-cancer effects. Now, if you're immediately exposed to radiation, what happens is your hair falls out. It's called epilation, and you get diarrhea and various other things. So what he did was he, he looked to see how many people hair fell out at different distances from the bomb. Now, this is distance from hypersensitive here in kilometers. 
Now, the, the, the radiation dose is this red line here. So this is, this is the, gamma, the gamma radiation from the bomb, which is the one that they use for determining you know, how much dose you've got against how much cancer. What they do is they, they take the radiation from the, from the gamma radiation, and you can see that at two kilometers here, and one kilometer here, there's about a 20 fold difference between the two. Okay? So in other words, there's, there's 20 times more radiation here, if you take that two, and you go down to point 0.1, than there is at two kilometers. So if you were two kilometers, you've got one twentieth of the radiation dose. But when they look to see what the cancer effects are, they're not a lot different. They're very much the same. Okay? So that so that caused Sawada to ask a question like, what's going on here? How can that be? If radiation causes cancer and you've got a 20-fold difference in the radiation dose, how is it that you've got hardly any difference in the cancer? So then he started to look at these effects of hair falling out. And he started to look right out here, three kilometers, four kilometers, five, six. And what he found was extraordinary. He found that people are six kilometers away from the same hypercenter, their hair was falling out and they got diarrhea. Now, how could that be if it's the if it's the radiation? It's not possible, is it? There's no radiation. Six kilometers away from the bomb, there's no radiation from the bomb. You know, you just see a flash in the distance, and the amount of gamma radiation that gets to you is nothing, because you're too far away. But yet, your hair starts to fall out and you get diarrhea. And this is all data. This is data that was actually put on a disk and you can get it from the Radiation Effects Research Foundation. So the answer is there must be something else that's causing these effects. And then when he went to look about where these effects were happening, he saw that they were in the areas where the rain was falling. So the moist air comes up into the bomb and then it rains. And this rain was black. And later on what happened is that they measured the areas of the black rain to see what was in it. Uh, and this was a study done in 1983 by some Japanese people, and they found that there was a lot of uh, uranium in the, in, the, in, the, in the rain. There was a lot of uranium in the rain. It was the uranium from the bomb casing. See, now that the, the Americans have always said there was no fallout because the bomb was exploded high enough for it not to suck any soil up into the bomb. But actually the bomb casing itself, the actual bomb itself was made of uranium. And only 5% of that uranium actually fissioned. So 95% of the uranium was turned into these microparticles, and down they came. And they were the cause of all these effects. It's the microparticles of uranium that are causing all these effects, you see. And so he put this... Let's see now. So he put this... Um, together and he worked out the he worked out what the dose must be. So he, what he worked out was that it's four out fine particles. So what he worked out was that in the areas away from the from the initial blast, there is the initial blast, okay, he found that the doses were enormously high, the effective doses were enormously high. So although the actual doses were zero the effect that they had on the population were very high. So what that does is it shows, it shows that the entire basis for the ICRP risk model, all of it, is, is completely invalid. All of it is just completely false. It's just mad stuff. So, so that's another, and that also went in as evidence. And the, and the judge was quite impressed with the Sawada. Because you see here, these are, this is, Exposed dose in grey. Now the reason he knows that is he's got another another measurements that were made on epilation on hair falling out. So he knows what external dose is necessary to produce your hair to fall out. But he found that hair, hair was falling out six kilometres away. So the dose here, the exposed dose, there it is. That's that red line there. He found that at five kilometres, six kilometres, four kilometres, three kilometres, the dose was almost one thousand millisieverts. Almost 1,000 millisieverts was the effective dose that they got from. That's the effective dose by which I mean the effect that it had, the biological effect that it had on the people. It's the same as if it had been an external dose of 1,000 millisieverts. Now, the point about the, inter the risk model at the moment, the RCRB risk model, is it's based on people who were this close and this close and this close to the, to the, to the bomb. But actually, if all those groups were given the same amount of radiation, 
then the entire model is, is, is completely false, and that's the end of it. So, that, so that's the second reason why the ICRP risk model, even for cancer, and even for external radiation, is dead in the water. So this is generally what was put into the court case, and it took three weeks to, 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 to do, and I had to cross-examine their witnesses. They, they, they ruled out our witnesses, they said our witnesses were all you know, biased because they were friends of Chris Busby. Uh, and they said their witnesses, um, who, di who didn't address any of our stuff, but just came out and calculated the doses. So they had one bloke who calculated the doses, and another guy who said that means the probability of cancer is so and so. And a, and a woman who was, uh, who, who's quite a famous woman for making mistakes on television. She came into the court case, and I don't want to say too much about her because I don't want to upset the judge. And I don't. But I, I did give her. I, I did cross-examine her quite creatively in, 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 in the witness box. <laughs> and one thing I will say that she did say, which, which, which people had a laugh about, if this goes out, is at one point she said um, when we were talking about uranium. She said, I was saying that, that Professor Miller in the United States had done these experiments with uranium that show that it has a massively high effect on, on, on DNA. And she said, oh, well, you know, she uses uh, radioactive uranium, and she, you know, I'd like to know what, what would happen if she used stable uranium. And at that point, there was kind of a big, <laughs> big silence in the court. You know? And I said, ah, oh, stable uranium, of course, yes. Well, perhaps I could put this document to you. And I gave her a list of all the uranium isotopes, you see. And she looked at it and she said, well, stable uranium's not there, because those are just the radioactive uranium isotopes. Anyway, of course, in the end, you know, the, the, um, even her, 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 her lawyer had to come in and sort of like shut it all down. I felt rather sorry for her, really, because it was such an awful shot, put it through the foot, you know. So it was just, but it wasn't the only mistake she made, but I don't want to go to town about it, you know, because she, I think, you know, she's, she's been in a, enough trouble lately with, with what with her talking about. She, she was walking through Fukushima um, with this BBC reporter and uh, telling him how safe it was and everybody could come back and live there. Oh! <laughs> you know, and, uh, and he said to her, well, you know, my Geiger counter says three microsieverts an hour, and, you know, is that, what does that mean? And she said, oh, well, that's only one millisievert in a year, that's perfectly safe. But actually, anybody can get a calculator and multiply three microsieverts by 365 by 24, and they find that the answer is 30, not one. Okay. So, so really, it does seem as if she had in mind already to say the one millisievert and how safe it was, you know, and didn't bother to do the calculation. And lots of people have attacked the BBC about that. And recently, I was told by my colleague Sean uh, McGee, Arclight, that uh, they've taken the video down now. <laughs> Just after the court case finished, they took the video down. So I think Geraldine Thomas, and also Geraldine Thomas, I have to say this, that she was the one that George Monbiot used in order to slag me off in The Guardian in 2011. So when he has a go at me in The Guardian about selling these tablets, you know, which... Which, which people really needed. Yes, yes, which I'm very pleased, and I can say at the moment that I'm, I'm still pleased that I advise people to take those calcium tablets. But it but, never happened, huh? No, they it didn't, didn't happen. No, it, it, no, people, the, the problem was that Monbiot said that I was selling tablets that didn't do anything. You didn't all. sell them. No, well, Ryan sold them, okay? And that they were too, and he, he accused me of selling them. Of course, I didn't sell them. You never got a penny, no, I didn't get a penny. But this guy, Ryan, sold them. But I'm glad he did, you know? even if he made money out of it, which I doubt. Um, but then the point is, he said, and Geraldine Thomas, the, you know, the expert on this issue, when, when asked about it, said, Christopher Busby doesn't know what he's talking about, these things don't bind to DNA, blah, blah, blah. So she was the woman who was in the witness box, okay. So I had every reason to, to um, you know, to get quite heavy with her, but I didn't. I was quite polite and gentlemanly. You know. So when are uh, the results? When will the... the yes, yeah, so well, the court case results are coming out. I guess in about September, I would think. We don't know. But I mean, one of the lawyers there said to me that, in his opinion, this is probably the biggest and most complex technical uh, it, um, uh, court um, case that had ever existed in English law, throughout the history of English law. That the complication and te te technical you know, requirements to understand in this case were, were, were absolutely astronomical. Um, 
And consequences too. Oh, well, the consequences too. Yes, that's right. I and mean, we had we had 24 box files of evidence that was just like the evidence, you know, up front. And then there were like libraries of evidence in the background that we could refer to when we were making our case. You know, so it was like, like all the time was getting out this box file, that box file. And I had but imagine they have to close down all those war industries well, of the, nuclear. The, 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 point, the point is this that. That if if this go, if if we win this case, if the appeals are allowed, then it, 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 it has certainly opened the door to the destruction of the nuclear industry. One for nuclear energy, the destruction of the possibility of carrying out nuclear war, because at the moment the generals, and I'll talk about this in another talk, the generals believe that a nuclear war is winnable because they believe all this stuff that the ICRP risk model tells them. They believe that there's no genetic damage occurring to children who are exposed to these small levels of fallout. But what we know from those stud the studies that I showed you earlier, the genetic studies after Chernobyl and the ones that we did for the uh, test veterans, we know that the smallest amount of exposure to these, these particles, and of course we see the same thing in Fallujah as well, where they've been exposed to the same uranium, depleted uranium particles, and with the, test and with the Gulf War veterans also. We know that these tiny amounts of radiation in, these, in the form of these particles will completely destroy the human race. There will be, not the human race, but all life. The all life, all life. animals, all, all yes. plants. All invertebrates, all everything. There will be a meltdown. And so, you, t you know, I see a book here that says something about the demographic cliff. Well, I think there's not going to be any demographic cliff. You know? show, show the book, that will be good. Um, because I can tell you that if they have a nuclear war, it will be a, it will, it will be a dem, not a democratic cliff, but it will be a democratic mount, a demographic mountain, because there will be no people. A uh, demographic what? Well, it'll be demographic. Instead of a cliff going down, it will be like a mountain going up, because there'll be no people. So there'll be like you know a, a complete lot. The demographic cliff is about how there's go, there are going to be so many old people and not enough new young people to look after them. Well, what's going to happen is going to be no young people, okay? Because that, that, that'll be the end of that. I mean, at the moment we see loss of fertility all over the place because of these increases in... in, in, in um, fertility cliff. Yeah, fertility cliff, that's right. So it's really, really scary. It's a very, very scary issue. And that's why I've come all this way, you know, uh, when I'm totally exhausted and I wish I could just sit on the beach with a bottle of wine and sleep. I'm here to, instead, I'm here talking to you people about the, the, the potential disasters which face us. And necessity to criminalise nuclear war systems. Well, of now. Of course, of course. Of course. Well, in well, your town, in your city, in your local place. Do it. Well, as Tissa says, I agree. You, you should come out because this is, the, this is the biggest public health scandal in recorded history and it's invisible. It's an invisible war that's being carried out against the population of the Earth by the nuclear industry, and it started in 1952, and it's already claimed 60 million deaths from can large from cancer, uh, uh, and, and countless millions of children have been killed in the womb, or deformed, or, or just not born. And they are profiting from and planning the Third World War. Well, uh, I, I think in some ways, you know, it's, well, it's easy to it's easy to blame people. You know, it's easy to say this is the reason or that's the reason because they're all rich people and they want to kill people and this and that. My own feeling is it's not that. I think that it has very much to do with men and women. But anyway, I've talked about this elsewhere. It has to do with the fact that men are insecure and so they make themselves strong, a particular kind of man anyway, by, by you know, being a soldier or, 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 or creating these huge weapons. Um, which they feel make them in some way uh, above nature. Above and they are nature. angry because they of their... Angry, they are angry with nature, yes. And in fact, Francis Bacon said to Queen, Queen Elizabeth, and Francis Bacon, like the father of science, he said to Queen, Queen Elizabeth I, he said, Madam, we will tame the whore nature. <laughs> oh, God. That's how they think. That's how they think. Yeah, so we do have to criminalize these corporations and uh, that's what we do here.
Let it be so. Let them be criminalized. Well, that's me. I, I, if I'm a general in this war, I'm a general on behalf of the whole nature. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christopher, for this wonderful speech. And uh, you are general indeed.